omega 1, omega 2, 0. The bottom three, it's V, 0, 0, 0, okay? It's, it's a velocity, okay, of, of, this, of this point here, right? Okay, well, um, first of all, already we know from this that all the twists that result from linearly combining these will point in a direction perpendicular to the z-axis. Okay, and how do we know that? Well, because this, there's a component in x and a component in y, but not a component in z, which means every resulting twist has to, you know, can have a component in x and y, but its z has to be 0, which means it has to be perpendicular to z. So that's the first clue. You know all the twists that result from linearly combining these two will be perpendicular to the z-axis, okay? Now, if you find the pitch, okay, use this equation, you dot product these, and you divide it by the dot product of these, and you find that they all equal zero. So if you dot product omega with v, obviously v is all zero, it will be zero. So that, that's another clue. Not only do these two, when they linearly combine, produce twists that are perpendicular to z, lines of action that are perpendicular to z, but they're all going to be red because their pitch is zero and those are all red rotations, okay? So it's, there's, going to be, there's going to, not going to be any translations or screws in this. It's all going to be red rotations, okay? Well, now let's do the location vector, okay? You can find um, that, uh, you know, what conditions must the location vector C satisfy? Well, if you do our vector here from lecture two, or, or our matrix, Right? This is how you find the c vector. You know the pitches are all zero. You know the omega is this one, and you know the v vector is this one. Then you times this in and write your three equations. If you times this by this, set it equal to zero, times this by this, set it equal to zero, times this by this, set it equal to zero. You get these equations, which now we can interpret. Okay? So it wouldn't, so, so look, from these two equations, if, if omega 1 and omega 2 were both at the same time allowed to be 0, then CZ could be non-zero. But the fact is, if omega 1 and omega 2 were 0, then the whole twist vector would be nonsense. It wouldn't even be a twist vector. It'd all, be, all six components would be 0. So you know from logic that omega 1 and omega 2, at least one of them needs to not be 0. They're either both non-zero or one of them is not 0. And therefore, from these two equations, that to be true, CZ has to be 0. Okay, and and okay, and then for this one, you know that um, for for you know if, if any one of these is not zero, okay, um, or the only way this is always true for every omega one and two, that's another way to think about it, is if c y and c z were also zero, okay, and certainly you can know. Um, a C vector of 0, 0, 0 is going to satisfy all these equations, okay? So now what we know, so let's put together everything we know. We know the linear combination of these two things um, will produce lines of action that are perpendicular to Z. We know they'll all be red because they have a pitch of 0. And we know that a location vector that works for all of them is right here at the center. Well, what shape is that, right? That is a disk, right? A disk of red lines, they're all red, they're all perpendicular to Z, and they all have a location vector right at the center there. So the disk is centered about there. So do you see how by linearly combining the twist mathematically and then deconstructing and using this logic, you can deduce the shape that it would be? And that, that can kind of mathematically prove to you that it will make a disk of red rotations. Okay, that looks like that. Okay, so now... Now that you, you, you know, I've proven to you that if you take any two intersecting uh, reds, you know, a twist, a rotation, rotational twists, and I linearly combine them, you'll get a disk. Let, let's prove to you that only two are independent. Well, I mean, we already, the last thing I did kind of prove that, but let's prove it a different way so you can know how to do this. Say, say you didn't know that this made, there were two independent things in this shape. How can you take any freedom space and know how many independent things are in there mathematically? Well... What you can do is just take some random sample of them, take a bunch. In this case, I just took four, which is dangerous. You might, you might want to take, you know, six or more, right? Because you know, you know, once, once a space has more than six, there are redundant degrees of freedom. You know, they're, they're not, um, or sorry, redundant degrees of freedom is not the right way. That'll confuse it with under constraint. But there, there, will, be a, there will be dependent uh, degrees of freedom because uh, you can only have up to six. Any more than that, and they're, they're dependent, right? 
So, so you could take six from within the disk. Um, in this case, I just took four to make it easy. And I knew there was only two. So as long as you take more than the number of independent ones, this, this approach should work. So take any number of these red things. Uh, give them an actual location. You know, this, this, they all intersect there, obviously, because it's a disk. This one's on the x-axis, this one's on the y-axis, because that'll be easy to find. And then I separate these by 30 degrees. Okay? If I make their twist vector, T1 will be this. T2 will be this. And you can check my math here. You know, I tried to make these uh, unit vectors here. Um, so we can multiply that in. It's magnitude, right? So that that's, would be that one. This would be this one. And this would be this one, T4. Okay, so check my math. Make sure you can build your twist vectors knowing that the C location is 0, 0, 0, and the omegas are pointing those directions, and the pitches are 0, right? Okay, so you construct the twist vectors. Again, if I had done six of them, I'd have two extra ones. But then what you do once you have uh, a bunch of twist vectors is you can clump them together into a matrix. You just stack them into a matrix here. You can see they're just kind of stacked right on top of each other here, okay? And, um, and, and then what you can do is you can use Gaussian elimination, okay? Now, if you don't know Gaussian el elimination, um, this is the one thing that would be nice to have taken linear algebra for for this course. Um, you know, it, it's, it's very easy to learn, so don't worry about if you haven't taken linear algebra. You can, you can definitely learn this, okay? You can just look it up, you know, online and, and teach yourself Gaussian elimination, or I, I can teach you how it works now. But what you do is if you have a bunch of vectors, the whole reason you do Gaussian elimination is to find out how many of those vectors you put in that matrix are independent. Okay, so right now we've got four uh, vectors in there and we're going we're gonna to do Gaussian elimination, find out how they're independent. Okay, how do you do Gaussian elimination? Well, let's move that up there. What you do is, okay, you consider each row like an equation, which is exactly what they essentially are. You know, if you time something by that, it'll equal another vector, and, and each of those can be broken out into equations, right? So, you know from algebra, if you multiply both sides of equation, you know, you change the equation, but it's still equal, it's still true. And then if you subtract equations from other equations, both sides, you're, you're doing the same thing to both sides, right? So, obviously. So, so, um, so, what the first step of Gaussian elimination, and I'm gonna stand up here, is okay, we're gonna just consider these two rows first, so ignore those two. Okay? What we want to do is times this row by a number that when I then add it to this row makes this zero right below there. Okay? And and, and you'll see why in a minute. Okay? So so what you always do is you, you would take negative this number divided by this guy and times it by this whole row and then add them together. And the whole reason you're doing that is so you can drop this to zero and change that to something. Okay, so if you do that, you get this. In this case, you take negative omega one, divide, you know, times two divided by omega two square root three, and then you times it by this whole thing, so this would now be negative omega one. This would be this thing, okay? And then you'd add them to these equations together and this would drop out to zero. The whole reason you did that is so this can be zero and this can be something non-zero, okay? So this is obviously uh, independent, and that's independent, okay? And then, and then now we're comparing this row with that row, and uh, what you get with that is, is again, you, you take negative omega, one, you wanna make this guy zero, so you take negative omega one times two divided by omega three, times it by this whole thing, and then add them together, and you'd find this goes to zero, which is the whole purpose of doing it, and now this is something, okay? Now, if you did Gaussian elimination on this row, comparing these two rows, you'd make this whole thing zero, and this would stay the same. Now, you do Gaussian elimination comparing this bottom row with this one, and of course, this would go to zero. And, and this is what you want to do. You want to make everything as zero as possible, and then you can't do anything to make these two zero. And so you end up with two things that can't be made zero that are uh, called pivots, and that tells, the number of pivots tells you how many of those vectors were independent, okay? So go look up Gaussian elimination. It's like one short chapter in a linear algebra textbook, um, and, and hopefully you can understand uh, um, how it works, okay? You can also just, MATLAB can do it for you. Um, there, you know, there's functions in MATLAB where you plug in uh, all the uh, number of vectors, and it just tells you how many are independent. But the whole point is to... Uh, reduce it down through Gaussian elimination, you know, 
reduce it down to fully zero matrices with, with pivots that are non-zero in there. And the number of pivots tell you how many are independent. So in this case, we just proved two, you know, if you go back, we proved of these infinite twists, you know, and, and like I said, I'd recommend taking six if you really have no clue. And then defining all six, put all six in there, do Gaussian elimination, you find two are independent. Okay? In this case, I, I did four because I knew it was two and I knew, you know, we'd get, uh, at the end of the day, two rows that were all zero, which means two of them were dependent, and these two were independent. Okay? Okay. All right, so now let's move to a different topic, but let me uh, take a break here, switch, switch my battery here. <laughs>